So uh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I, I love Bosch and so when uh, Paula and, and Colin asked me if I'd like to, to share, uh, Paula said this was my talk title, which is great because, you know, I, yeah, we've all had the happy days with the Bosch and the sad days. And, you know, um, so when I say I love Bosch, it's the same as, as, as in the same way I love my children. <laughs> you have the good days and then you have the other six days of the week. And, <laughs> which is why you should have more than two children. I have three children, which, <laughs> and my children have started to hear me say this next phrase and start to question it. Um, and I always joke that I actually have two children plus one for spares. Um, so hopefully they don't say, I've got one parent and one for spares. That was, that's going to turn out badly. Um, so, so whilst to, to come to that place is to really, I, I thought we, um, in the sense that everyone else is going to share the ongoing story of Bosch, I, I would tell um, a story that led to loving Bosch. Because I don't think if you, if you worked at McDonald's and found Bosch, there's not much in it for you. So there's probably a lot of context and a lot of, of even, you know, the pain that you've gone through in your life to find Bosch and go, oh my God, that solves that problem, that problem, that problem. This is the best thing ever. And so perhaps uh, when, when we ask the question, why don't more people love Bosch? My gut feeling is not enough people have actually experienced real production pain and then had thoughts about why, why their life is so terrible. To then, to then see what Bosch does. So I'll tell the story of, of where I came from. Um, to put in a little context, um, across our customers last year, I, I estimate we have about 50 different things running on, on a bunch of different Bosches. There may be a bigger number than that. Um, a lot of those are running under pipelines and that, um, and relatively stably. And I really think that, that Bosch is allowed, uh, in addition to concourse, is allowed um, I don't have a cool Bosch t-shirt on me, so I, I'll go with the concourse t-shirt because they tell a similar story of um, of deterministic awesomeness. But uh, so it's really, you know, we're moving forward really well in terms of not, not us so much as the customers, the things that are happening. You just can move forward so fast when you've got a, a rock solid platform. Um, but to tell a story, I think we'll go back in time, which uh, now I get to use my keynote skills. <sighs> All right, watch this. Oh yeah, look at that, that was cool. Um, <laughs> As long as you have low ambitions for what you'd like to achieve with Keynote, you can pretty much do them. Um, April 2012 I, um, was when Bosch was, was publicly announced. And, and I happened to be at the event when it was happened. Now, you don't just happen to be at VMware for the day that something that you want to see arrive arrives. You have to know about it in advance. And so, yes, I was lucky in that I knew people at VMware who were telling me this stuff was coming out. So we'll go back further. Um, 2010, I joined a company called Engine Yard, who were one of the first companies who took the name Paz and said, this is what we are. Which was great because I called us a hosting company, um, which wasn't very cool. So platform as a service, much cooler name. And, um, but, but in a way, you know, my, little, my short duration at Engine Yard short relative to the entire length of engine yard and, and to our entire profession um, doesn't really, I don't think it's respectful, so we'll go back a little bit further. All right, so engine yard was created in 2006, and I think its story is an interesting story that leads to why Bosch. Um, and I, I always really enjoyed the, uh, when I came later in, in engine yard's life, I enjoyed trying to uncover the history. You know, a lot of organizations have amnesia. Um, it's uh, not just companies, but you know, governments have amnesia. Um, we all have it. So it's interesting sometimes to go back and hopefully we learn why we did things. And um, doesn't sometimes mean you get to fix them, but you can <laughs> like go, okay, now I know why we have Gen 2. So Engine Yard, in, in even, you know, probably many of its products now, Kevin, is that right? We're still cloud and, and Gen 2 is still. Um, and uh, most cool kids today would, would not be touching Gen 2. There aren't barge poles long enough. No one has barges. It's really hard to get the right tools to poke Gen 2. Um, but in 2006, it was chosen because it was the only OS platform uh, or distro environment where we could do 
uh, we could create the VPSs or slices in a 64-bit environment. And some of them knew Gen 2, because they were hackers. You know, they'd played with, they'd built their own thing. And so we picked Gen 2. You might think, well, okay, we'll pick it today, and we'll change our mind tomorrow. Some of these things you can never undo. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you get some skills, you've got the people, is it really worth? I mean, I think in the two years I was at Engineered, every six months we would have the, why haven't we switched to Ubuntu conversation? Because that would make us cool, and, uh, oh, yeah, but then we'd be pulling down arbitrary packages, and we'd be own our own packages, and it's, it's a very hard conversation, because, uh, well, we'll go through it. So, so what did we get out of Gen 2? Um, so one of the things we could do, if you've, and this is in part, because I'm sure many of you, who, who's ever used Gen 2? Look at all the pain that you've wrought. See, you're here with me on this story. So, so Gen2 um, is wonderful in the sense, once you start to understand what you're really trying to achieve with a, with, with a stable production system that you know, your company wants to run on top of, is you get to build things from source. Um, so that means you can twiggle the flags, you can, you, know, you can use the specific source you want to use, you can build the specific de dependencies you want to use. Um, there is a corollary to that which we discovered in, in the history of Engine Yard, was what happens when the source disappears? <laughs> um, so I heard about this, in, 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 but this is a very exciting story. Yeah, so what happens when one of your packages cannot be built anymore? So um, anyway, well, obviously there's, there's solutions to this, but uh, <laughs> packaging script is just a bash script. I, I mean, I wish it was just a bash script. It turns out that it's actually a, a bash script but there are magical wizarding rules that you must follow in order to be a correct you know, e-build. Um, and so uh, uh, when I found Bosch, it was like, oh my god, I can build my own packages and no one's going to tell me I'm a bad human being. Um, and then uh, Gen2 has the, the system for, uh, for taking, you know, you can build the binaries and that they can be built. So you're not building source on the machines, you, know, you have your binaries. And, uh, but in its essence, you get to curate your own distro. Um, so let's have a look what Bosch does. Bosch builds packages from source. It has a packing and strict, uh, packaging script in Bash. We get uh, compiled binaries that are available to us. And, and you might not have thought of it this way, but every Bosch release is a distro. It's a distro for, very, for one very specific thing. And, um, and I became very much a fan of this idea that, yeah, I mean, you don't get the reuse inherently of, of one package for many reasons, which is what a standard distro is for. But you know what? I don't want that. I want, I want a Ruby for the specific job of running CF Containers Broker that is part of a, a Docker Bosch release. I want another Ruby that might be exactly the same or it might not, but I want it specifically described to run the cloud controller. And uh, I'd rather solve the problem of managing those packages horizontally than the worry of if I touch this one here that's shared across 50 different Bosch releases, what's the outcome? Um, and so, fundamentally, they have a very similar uh, role in, in the packaging, so that was really interesting. Um, in the history of, of, of Engine Yard, we were the, one of the first people that, uh, so Ezra, who uh, was one of the founders of Engine Yard, met uh, Adam from OpsCode, and uh, both of them were very excited about this thing called Chef. And uh, you know, Adam was writing Chef, Ezra was using it, and I think we were one of the first companies to really put Chef into production. This is great, I've got Dennis here. Dennis and Kevin are gonna keep me on track for the, for the history of Engine Yard. Um, and, uh, and so one of the first sort of releases of Chef was 06, uh, 01. I have no idea why so early they were with four bullet points, but. Um, and uh, by the time I arrived, and by the time I left, the version we were at was 06, 01. Um, <laughs> what had happened was, was we had, because we were innovating in a sort of forked universe to OpsCode itself. OpsCode wanted to go with a chef server model where, you know, you describe it and pull it down. We wanted our own model of we would control the chef repos and we would, you know, we had a different thing called Chef Solo. And so a lot of the innovation around how this all worked and the, and the community grew separately. And in essence, uh, we were competitors with OpsCode, who are now Chef. Um, and uh, so one of the things we did differently that we never unwound was we had two Chef runs. So we ran our Chef, 
right, that set up Nginx and, and the app, to all the, install all the packages and everything, and, and you had a perfectly designed cluster of machines. And then we said, now you can run some Chef. And you would, you know, you could provide your own bespoke Chef. And people did all sorts of interesting things, run Redis and other systems. Um, there would be competition for certain files, as they would want their ideas, Nginx being one of them, the configuration for MySQL. And uh, so the problem was that we lost the ability to easily move our platform forward with confidence. Um, and there were a lot of, it was a lot of heartache. Every conversation around curating the, the cloud cookbooks is what they were called, was, was, uh, was fraught with this. Well, we have a customer who did this once. This is a terrible place to have, have an experience of trying to move a platform forward. But another one was, we literally really couldn't move Chef forward either, because to what? And how many, are we gonna do this every week? And now do we need to let customers know that Chef has changed in some way and their cookbooks running, it was, it was a nightmare. And, uh, and like many things, if it's just a bit too hard, you just don't do it today. Do that 365 days a year for five years and you get that. Everyone feels bad about it, but no one really has the job to fix it. And um, so let's have a look what Chef did for us. Um, and my gut feelings is what Chef does for everyone. You install some packages. I mean, it's in Ruby. What's cool about Chef it, at a glance is that you get these two runs through it. You get to write it in Ruby, uh, a programming language, and you can write, you know, high level functionality in there. But, but this is pretty much all we ever did. I think this is what people use Chef for. We install software packages, which were built either by people we don't know or some other system that we did control. Uh, so we, we were installing our Gentoo packages. Um, you create configuration files. And Chef has two ways to do that. There is the file command, and then there's the template command. I don't know why. Like, they could just have one, the template command, which might do templating. Um, one of those types of files might be a wrapper for Monit. So we use Monit, coincidentally. And then you tell Monit to start monitoring, because that's his job. And uh, so it turns out, if we look at what Bosch does, it installs packages, it creates config files, we install Monit scripts, and then we start Monit. And so when people ask me, why don't we, you know, why not Chef? It's like, well, what else do you want? Like, what, what is that thing that you can't do with, you know, if you, Look at what you're using Chef for. Let's get rid of all of Chef and just describe the packages in a list. Just have like a folder full of template files and process them all with the same inputs. So with Chef, you would sort of say, here are my inputs for this one, here are my inputs for this one. Let's just throw all the inputs into all files and let's just default to Monit. Like in Chef, you can pick different um, process monitoring. And so to my mind, the convergence down to a very simple way of doing config management was one of the things I liked about Bosch. Um, all right, so engineer, we were a Ruby company. We sort of grew on the back of, of the growth of Ruby. We made Ruby applications, specifically Ruby on Rails, uh, easy to do. And, um, and so we, uh, um, a chef was written in Ruby. And so on, when you brought up a machine as a customer, like, you know, we, we brought the machines up for you and then we ran chef, but you needed Ruby. So we had Ruby on there to run that. Um, the problem we had was that when we started, there was Ruby 186. And that's what the noise it used to make. Um, <laughs> that was provisioning. <laughs> all right? They all had a ringtone. Um, so, so Chef was running on, on Ruby, and, and our customers' applications were running on Ruby, and you got it on the same Ruby like the same package, you know, as you would app get install, um, e-select, and, uh, and then a new version of Ruby came out. Some of our customers wanted to use it, and some didn't. And so this was a tortured process of untangling this and providing the option for, we ended up having, we had to have our own Ruby for our chef stuff, and then and a whole and we basically forked that whole thing and isolated it and said, this is us for, for the chef called Resin. And then there was the option to pick rubies. And, you know, it was the, it was the learning lessons over time. But, they, you know, you can imagine the cost 
and then the R&D cost and the meeting cost and the customer dissatisfaction and, you know, why are you taking so long to do the simple job of offering us 187? And we had a similar problem later on where we went from one Amazon region, oh, we'll get to Amazon. Um, got to the point where, where um, you know, the Ruby maintainers wanted to move the hell on and just wanted to play with shiny new Ruby. Well, we were a distro company, really. You know, in a, in a sense, like you, as a new company, you still sort of mentally map yourself to legacy or existing uh, industries and sort of say, we like that. We were like Red Hat, except we managed running systems. So we, we managed packaging. We took it very seriously. Um, we had some people who took you know, package and security maintenance very seriously. And one of the things, because we still had customers on 186, and we did for five years, it took us a long time to get them off, um, was we maintained security for that. Um, so, along the path of Engine Yard came, so we were running our own servers. In fact, in the early days, that was one of Engine Yard's sort of um, conference Way, ways to turn up to a conference was to come in with their servers and say, look at our servers. These are awesome. That's right, they did that, didn't they? Um, they were very excited about their servers. That was 2007. That was 2007. Um, you have to stop doing that after a while because obviously that involves downtime. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, your app's not running. We're taking the service to the conference. Um, <laughs> And, um, and we had all our own, you know, somewhat bespoke code and whatever for bringing up s slices and things, and, and Amazon came out around the same time that Chef um, was, 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 was coming around. And, um, but Amazon Web Services didn't look like this back then. It looked like that. <laughs> Very benign. This looks helpful, doesn't it? <laughs> like, you would build an entire business on that thinking nothing could possibly go wrong. <laughs> and, um, but, and, and so, yeah, we had the, we had the, the challenge of, of having to build an entire platform from scratch. Like, so at this point, we, we were now a, a bigger company, we had more funding, and, and so we could do a bigger investment instead of little scrappy little shell scripts that no one saw. We now started to build a customer-facing portal that would provision clusters, run Chef, and your app would come up, and, and all that, and billing, and all that other stuff that you just have to do in order to be in business. Um, and, and just to go back, I mean, as over time, Amazon became a machine and, and a very big public presence, and new things would come out, and our customers would say, well, why can't I use the ELBs? It's like, well, you don't really need them. Um, we've got, you know, we're using HA proxy on every machine. What, what exactly do you need ELBs for? It's like, all right, why can't I use IAMs? Like, for God's sake, right? <laughs> we built everything before they had that stuff. We don't need it. Shh. Um, so staying, staying with Amazon, you know, and, and, and essentially competing with them. And, and, and uh, so I guess we were one of the first organizations in the world to realize that, that our days were going to be challenged by our very own <laughs> vendor. Um, hence, we have this, this whole multi-cloud premise here. Uh, not just because of Amazon, but mostly because of Amazon. Um, so there. And so we built this thing called AppCloud. And uh, tens of millions of dollars, really, uh, would have been spent. Um, perhaps, perhaps even more than that. So, uh, over years, right? And when they built this, there was only one cloud and only one API to build it against. So the idea of, of building for multi-cloud wasn't really a concept. You had no idea of what the abstractions might be. Even if, and then, then, then there's the, you know, engineer, engineers had this idea of, of uh, agile development only build what you need. And unfortunately, that idea of only build what you need often means, let's not worry about abstractions today. Or tomorrow. Or tomorrow. Um, all right, there's a number of very angry engine up people here. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and it's really hard to add them in later on sometimes. And it's hard to plan them in advance, so it's a hard problem in, in general. I mean, one of the ones we missed was, and it's, it's hard, not really visualized there, but was uh, then they came out with the second region. Oh my lord! Oh, wow, that was a surprise. Did not see that coming. Um, you know, you just imagine. You know, you had we were deploying to Amazon. That was it. We were deploying to Amazon, and then they said, "There's this other one." What? What does that mean? What do you mean? There's another one? We were we were doing this, and now you've got that. Um, and so, yeah, the effort that goes into orchestrating and, and ex you're adding another access to things. 
Um, so in essence, we, you know, this was our, our um, the, the thing we did. You know, we did packet management, config management, infrastructure management. Um, that's what we did. The value proposition was, was always nebulous. Not nebulous, not the right word. Um, the value that customers saw didn't always manage. You know, they, we would still have to have this do-it-yourself. Yeah, oh, oh, sorry, how do I put it? We suspected our main competitor wasn't Heroku. It was people who said, but I could do this myself. Like, why, do, why am I paying you extra? Like, like, they saw the value of Amazon, because, you know, infrastructure people need to be paid. But exactly what are you doing? It's like, you know, fuck you. Um, <laughs> we didn't have emoji back then, so um, you could put that in support tickets. But, um, yeah, it was... Um, and so, you know, you, you, all our code bases get a little old, a little weary, and... and um, how am I going for time, by the way? You're doing great. Doing great for time. Yeah. Doing fine. <laughs> doing fine. Matt doesn't want to come up next. <laughs> um, and uh, 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 so finish. So, so, so okay. So you, your code gets a little weary, and you know, you, the company starts to want to be multi-cloud. You know, there was cloud stack. There was these other things coming along, and, and um, open stack. And um, but our code was in no way ready for that. And we had different ideas. We weren't really a container company even back then. You know, Cloud Foundry had come out by about now. So we were in 2011, 2012. We weren't, the next phase wasn't going to be containers in any shape. And, um, but they wanted to redo everything. You know, they were open to redoing the entire product to, to, to open up to other ideas that we'd learned. And so it was at this time, I discovered uh, I was, I started to know through Twitter our enemies at VMware. Um, but they were funny enemies, in a sense. James Waters was hilarious. Um, we would banter, and he was funny. I knew Dave McCrory, um, he's a good friend. Uh, he, he ended up you know, taking Cloud Foundry to Warner Music. And, but it was Dave that, that had telling me quietly there was this, this thing that was going to be called, it was Bosch, and it was... It was how, you know, Cloud Foundry had come out in the first year with some chef recipes and, and um, very irregular updates. But uh, they worked and people were happy. But they weren't what VMware was using. And that pissed people off and it caused problems. And so they, they brought out Bosch. And, and this is what made me fall in love with the Cloud Foundry project as a, as a mission. It's like, because it can you trust VMware? Don't know. But they just shared how they run this thing. And that, that was pretty, uh, pretty powerful to me. And, um, but I was still at Engine Yard and still worried about Engine Yard problems. And here was a system that just came out that was completely open sourced and solved 80% of what we found hard. And so to Crickets, I asked, does anyone want to come down to VMware with me to investigate? To Crickets, I brought it back to Engine Yard. And unfortunately, due to, um, you know, I was a junior executive. In my, I misbehaved and I wasn't, I didn't have a lot of political capital about that time. No one listened to a word I said. And so I became the world's number one Bosch evangelist, but no one at Engine I gave two shits. And that was hard. Um, you know, I could build demos of things in a week and they were still discussing what they might like to build for their V2. And it was, it was becoming confusing internally. Why is Nick making this stuff, that's not what we're doing. I built an API in a, in a week, it was a little Ruby thing, it just said like, you had a post API, and you'd send a request, and it would talk to Bosch, because Bosch has an API. You all know that, right? <laughs> it's not private and secret and internal, and if Dimitri says that, he's lying. Um, <laughs> as did every product manager like Matt ever. Uh, they lied and said, there's no, it's private, don't use it. No, it's awesome and it's fabulous and you should talk to it. Um, and it's really stable because no one touches it. Um, you know, you construct your manifest and you give it to Bosch and up comes a thing, a versionable thing, a thing independently versioned from every other thing you brought up. You bring, let's say you want it, so my demo was Redis. This was exciting. I, you know, you go post instances, you get a Redis cluster. Post instances, another Redis cluster. They could all be versioned independently. 
Like, I didn't have to upgrade them all. And it was just, that was exciting. Couldn't, you know, anyway. Um, it was an engine yard, I had the idea, okay, that's not working, what else could I do? All right, we could, we could start doing independent services, we could do React as a service, and, and not have to sort of jam it into our old system, and it doesn't have to be just for engine yard customers, because 100% of engine yard customers didn't want React, I said React, I meant React, um, because they weren't using it, so, what, but they, no. And then the last one I had was, um, the idea of like, this is really cool. You could like use this as a, a delivery system for systems in the enterprise. It'd be like an app store. And I gave that, that was the last meeting I had with the CEO. And he didn't like that idea. And so I left. And there are so many things we can do with this, uh, with this system. Um, so I, I, I wish to finish there. I, I, there was an entire day of, of interesting stories that are gonna come on. That was, that was how I got to Bosch. I, uh, you know, many of you have followed, have joined my journey along the path in the first year while well, I was still an engineer. There was, there was like three public people playing with Bosch. There was myself, 30, um, uh, a couple others who have, uh, Brian McLean, maybe one or two others who have, uh, names I've forgotten now, but, um, and, then, and then it started to grow. And people started to, you know, people started to find Bosch. And then people started to use Bosch for reasons unrelated to running Cloud Foundry. And uh, whilst it can be a little painful to be so early, <laughs> it is so exciting to have a room full of 200 people that think Bosch is pretty okay. So I'm pretty excited to sit down and shut up um, <laughs> after a whole week of talking. So um, thank you very much and uh, have a lovely day. <laughs>